Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here's a really interesting article by Rami Ismail talking about the top 10 tips for surviving the indie apocalypse. This is an excellent article, so let's read through it and see what his tips are. If you don't know who he is, he's basically one half of the indie studio of Lambier. This is the indie studio responsible for some pretty huge indie hits. Games like Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, and Nuclear Throne. They've been around since 2010, so since before indie game became a huge thing. So anyways, Rami does have quite a lot of experience in the indie game industry. And nowadays I think he's a consultant, so he's still up to date. And also before we read this article, let me actually ask you a question. How many of you are familiar with the term indie apocalypse? Now this was a term that was really big around, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Right after Steam actually announced Steam Greenlight and then Steam Direct. Back then there were a lot of people talking about the indie apocalypse. So essentially this is going to be the end of the world because anybody can just put any game on Steam. So that is going to make it really difficult to find success. But nowadays, this word in the apocalypse, this one, isn't really heard too much nowadays. Nowadays, I think people have already realized, okay, so this is new normal. It is just really difficult to find success with indie games. So that's just normal. So I'm curious to know how many of you who might be quite younger developers, how many of you are familiar with the word in the apocalypse? But anyways, let's read this article and see if we can learn something from it. This article is based on a talk that Kami gave during the Reboot Develop Blue conference in Croatia. This was just earlier this year, so it's relevant to 2023. So let's see all of these steps, starting off with the first one, which is understand the risks. He goes on to say, if you have an infinite amount of money, then please go ahead and maximize your opportunities. If you have an infinite amount of money, you can take risks. But if you're just starting out, your biggest obstacles are probably that you haven't shipped anything, you have no money, and you have no experience. So at that point, you should figure out how to minimize your risks. Ismail advised that studios start by making a game that's not expensive. He shared that Radical Fishing, the original Flash version of what became Ridiculous Fishing, which again was a huge hit, this one cost around $60 and was made on school computers. Now this is definitely the advice that I would give to you, which is start off simple, start off with a simple idea and don't spend tons of money. If you're just getting started, then the main thing you really need to get is just experience. You need to make some small games and get that experience to actually learn how game development actually works. So you should be trying to gain all that knowledge as cheaply as possible. Perhaps you can buy some asset from the store, perhaps spend a couple hundred dollars, but definitely don't go ahead and get some custom music, custom art, and spend tens of thousands of dollars. So I definitely agree, minimize how much money you spend on your first few games. If you do that, then essentially you minimize risks. If you only spend a hundred dollars on making your first game, if that game flops, then that's really not much cost. Number two, don't chase the market. This is an interesting one because there's actually two ways to go about this. He says in the games industry, things move in waves, but they're also weirdly unpredictable. Giving the example of Overwatch, which was a hero shooter with lots of abilities, that was a huge success in 2016. But in 2018, the biggest hit was God of War, which was a very narrative-driven game, so completely different from Overwatch. So the game market does move quite quickly. So on this one, I would say don't just chase the market if your goal is to find success. Especially as an indie dev, I would say do not chase the AAA market. However, there's another side to this coin. There's actually a positive way to chase the market. That is what some people have called fast follow. Essentially, you find in the game that is finding tons of success, and you very quickly, in about two to three months, make a game similar to that, but adds a few things on top. That is one strategy that can find some success. Again, if you manage to make the game actually really quickly. One very clear recent example of that is Vampire Survivors. It was a huge hit that came out of nowhere, and there were some games that came out shortly afterwards that were based on the same core concept, but they built it in different ways. By now that is pretty much saturated, if you make a Vampire Survivors like nowadays it's really difficult to find success. But right after the game was a huge hit, at that point there was a period of time when it was possible to find success by just being like Vampire Survivors but with something different. So that is a strategy that can sometimes work. Now number three, test your business case. And this is actually an interesting one. If you are going to pitch your game to publishers, then Ismail recommends that you start pitching with the five publishers you hate the most. Basically the idea is your very first pitch is probably going to be your worst pitch. As with anything, you gain experience the more times you do it. So you basically don't want to give your very worst pitch to the number one publisher that you'd like to get. So the idea is basically get some experience before you actually talk to the publisher that you would really like to have. Now for me, I've never pitched the publisher, so I'm not too familiar with this one, but this seems like an interesting approach. He also talks about in the context of self-publishing. And with that, there are still ways to test your business case. Basically testing your game idea, is this game idea actually viable? The main way to test is really just to start putting out content. So start putting out some GIFs on Twitter, start putting out videos on YouTube, do all kinds of things. You can do that and then look at the actual data in order to decide is this idea worth pursuing or not. One interesting strategy to try to find what game you should pursue is to basically essentially pick out, let's say, three to five game ideas that you have. 
and basically do a mock-up of what those games would be like and build up a Steam page for each one of those games. Then you try to promote them, make some kind of videos, make some kind of gifts, maybe even look into actually paid advertising. Do that in order to test and see which one of those actually interacts the best, see which one gathers the most amount of wishlists after your test. You can do that to see which one converts best and then decide which one you want to actually follow through. That is an interesting strategy that can find good results, but also requires quite a ton of work, but either way, it's good to know. Tip number four is assume failure. The only healthy way to run any business, as Mel said, is to assume that at the end of everything, your game does not make any money. For example, when seeking funding from a publisher, make sure you ask enough not only to make the game and ship it, but also to keep the studio running for three to six months, enabling you to get ready to pitch your next game. Again, I've always self-published all my games, and I've always kept my costs real low, so this kind of thing isn't really relevant to my own personal experience, but the core idea here is solid. That is why I would never recommend anyone to just quit their day job in order to start making indie games. This is an extremely tough business, so I would definitely not encourage you to put yourself in a position where if your game fails, you suddenly go homeless. That's a terrible thing, so definitely make sure you don't risk that much. And also another tip is right here, even if your game is successful, you don't get money at launch. For example, on Steam, it won't take you at least two months in order to actually receive your very first paycheck. See so if your bank account hits zero by the time you actually launch your game. Even if the game is successful, you might still have problems, so definitely make sure you allow for that buffer. Then for tip number five, don't aim too high. He mentions how his former studio volume beer, the team was never bigger than seven people, and most of the time it was two to five people. So with that, they only made the games that could be made by two to five people. That is definitely a great tip. Sometimes you can have a game that actually finds success in the beginning, but then you can risk it all and essentially go bankrupt by your second game because you expended so much. Again, this goes back to risk management. Make sure you keep in mind what resources you have available, how many people you have in your studio, and make sure your game can be built with that team. Here he says, we made a deal when we started that we would never grow, and it worked out just fine because the games we were making were consistent with what we could do. And also, just make better games, he said. You don't have to grow to do that. Your team is getting better, getting more experience, more used to each other. Eventually, your team starts to being better without you having to grow. Now, for me personally, this is something that I really believe in. I know some people have dreams of having an indie studio with like a dozen people making really complex games, but for me personally, that has never been my dream. For me, I'm perfectly happy working by myself, maybe with an artist sometimes. So for me, I've never had the desire of building a huge indie studio. But for you, if that's the kind of dream that you have, definitely keep in mind the risks with growing too fast, too quickly. Next tip number six, build your brand. Game developers need to establish a human connection with their audience and build an identity that makes them stand out. He challenged developers to imagine two friends talking about their games in the future. What do you want them to say? So this goes back to what exactly is your goal in terms of indie games? Are you trying to make just a single game and that's it, you're going out? Or do you want to keep making games essentially for the rest of your life? If so, then yeah, it is important to keep in mind your brand and essentially build a community of people that do like your games, do like your style. And like says here, he also emphasized that this does not mean developers need to keep making games in the same genre. For example, in Flambeer's games, they are all wildly different. Although, whilst being different, they do have a consistent identity. You can look at all of them and see, yep, this was made by Flambeer. And when speaking of brands, speaking of building a community, that actually brings upon one of the sort of negatives of working with a publisher. For example, two huge indie hits, Cult of the Lamb or Hotline Miami, they are definitely huge hits that millions of people have played. However, out of those millions of people, chances are not many of them actually know the developers. They might know the publishers, but not the developers. So if you do decide to go with a publisher, keep in mind you are possibly sacrificing this part, or at least it's going to be much more difficult to actually go through the publisher and get to the actual final player, and somehow turn them into fans of your studio and not the publisher. Next tip number seven, embrace sincerity. Being sincere as an individual is crucial to being seen as reliable. Every game has the fingerprint of its creator. So once again, this goes back to definitely make sure you don't make games just because you want to build something that was popular. Games are extremely complex, extremely difficult to make, so whatever game ID you decide to follow, make sure it is actually sincere to who you are. For example, for me, I hate puzzle games, so it would not be wise for me to build a puzzle game. Tip number eight, avoid the obvious. Obvious game ideas are the ones to avoid. Now this is one that I sort of agree, sort of disagree with. You can definitely go too obvious to the point where it's basically completely generic and your game has nothing original to do with it. But at the same time, if you counter that, you might go so unique that nobody actually understands your game. So the balance between making it familiar and unique, that is a very tough balance to strike. Tip number nine is fail faster. Basically, this is the concept where you build a prototype and quickly try to see, does this prototype work? Does this core game idea is it actually viable or not? If you've made a handful of prototypes, chances are you know there are some of them that don't work at all and some of them do work right away. So being able to analyze those prototypes and figure out should you actually pursue this idea, does this work like this or not, 
Again, this goes back to minimizing risk. So the faster you fail, the cheaper it will be to actually fail. So if you have something that is not really working out, some game idea that you thought would work, but once you make the prototype, it does not work, it might be wise to actually just quit that idea right there and move on to something else. But at the same time, I would also say that this depends on genre. For example, for me personally, I love working on management games. So games with tons of interlocking systems. And for those, a quick prototype might actually not be representative of the final game. So there are some genres, like for example, the games that Vlambeer does. There are some of those genres that are pretty much just based on gameplay and on a quick prototype, you can easily see, is this game idea going to work or not? But there are others where it does require quite a bit more work in order to actually get to a functional prototype where you can actually validate, is this idea viable? But yep, in general, fail faster is excellent advice. Tip number 10, be luckier. Yeah, that's definitely a good tip if you can find it. So just stop being unlucky. I've made a video on this topic quite a while ago. And yeah, on the concept of luck, this is definitely something that definitely exists. It is definitely a factor in game development and really anything in life. However, I also believe that if you do things right, if you pick the right game idea, if you focus on marketing, if you focus on doing all the right things, you can't actually guarantee success, but you can definitely minimize the amount of luck that you require in order to actually find success. So yep, luck is a factor as it is a factor in pretty much anything in any part of life. But I believe that by being smart, you can essentially minimize how much luck affects your final result. And tip number 11, there is no indie apocalypse. So this goes back to what I mentioned at the very beginning of this video. How many of you know this word? Because this word, indie apocalypse, this hasn't really been mentioned in pretty much any website for the past few months or even years. One excellent comparison that I've heard in some kind of article that I read ages ago, basically how nowadays becoming an indie game dev is kind of like starting a band. For many years now, pretty much anyone can start a band. I mean, a guitar costs, what, like 30 to 50 bucks? So the barrier to entry to actually making music is super low. And nowadays with the internet, you can easily put your music up for sale and try to actually become a musician. So there is no barrier to entry. And becoming an indie game developer is pretty much the same thing. The tools are all free nowadays. There's tons of free education. So I think the reason why the word indie apocalypse isn't used anymore is because people have realized there's no indie apocalypse. This is just pretty much a new normal. Finding success in terms of indie games is extremely difficult and that's just going to be how it is for the next few years and forever really. There's a massive amount of people that want to make games and whilst there is a large amount of people that want to actually play games, there's more people making them than people have time to play them. So by now, for the past few years, the indie market has already been 100% saturated. So the good news is things aren't necessarily getting much worse, but the bad news is things are definitely not going to get any easier. People are going to keep making tons and tons of games and are going to have lots of challenges in order to actually find the players to play those games. This goes back to the first tip, which is minimizing risk. Just like with making a startup or any kind of risky business, this is an extremely difficult business, so definitely make sure you don't risk your whole life on making sure that your game finds success, because chances are it probably won't. Now that's a bit negative, so let me end on a positive note, which is whilst it is really difficult to find success, that also really depends on what success means to you. For me personally, I'm currently working on my Steam game, Dinky Guardians. And for that game, my definition of success is actually pretty achievable. And the reason for that is because I'm not really spending too much money on the game. I have a pretty low cost of living, so my risk is actually pretty low. And even if the game does fail, I know for certain that I will not go homeless, I will not go hungry. So even though this is my ninth Steam game, I'm still very much paying attention to all this advice, like primarily the one about minimizing risk. So depending on how you define success for your games, it is really difficult, but it is possible. Here's a quick update from the future. I actually recorded this video a few months ago and since then I have already released my game. Thankfully it has done quite well based on my modest realistic goals. Alright, so that's the article. It's really interesting. Definitely go ahead and read the whole thing. I hope you found my thoughts interesting. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.